Hi, I'm Scott Wilson, the director for the K-8 Elementary Physical Education Workshop. I'd like to take you out to the ball game and catch the vision in 2020, not COVID-19, and experience physical literacy at its best. I'm sorry we weren't able to meet at the beautiful campus at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo this summer, like we have the past 46 summers, but year 47, we have to go virtual because of the pandemic. The main meeting place that we have a majority of our activities and sessions, the rec center, is being used as a 400 bed alternate care facility for COVID-19 patients. So our committee decided to go virtual this summer, so here we are. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to our committee. Give them a pat on the back, round of applause, thumbs up, they're awesome. We put in over thousands of hours to put this together, and to them I say thank you. I also want to thank our presenters. we got presenters from all over the world that have put together over 30 different presentations for you to choose from. And I don't want to single out any rookies because a lot of people, this is their first time. We've got a lot of rookie presenters as well. As a matter of fact, I think we're all rookies because this is the first time we've ever done this virtually. So you have to forgive us for any unforced errors that may happen to pop up during these presentations. Well, with that being said, we've got several uh, socials that we'll be having as well. And we can even double and triple the fun that we're going to have. So those presentations that you have to choose from, don't chicken out trying to use something new. We don't monkey around when it comes to our sessions. Our presenters will keep you moving. You may have to duck or you may have to jump. Just don't miss out on the bacon. Well, the time has come. All the lineups are in. Now it's time to play ball. Go. Hello, Joe. Hi, Mel. How are you? How are you? <laughs> so weird to finally chat with you in person, kind of in person. Well, we're what, how many thousands of miles apart and <laughs> what, 15, 15 hour time difference? I know, I know. So, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Mel Hamada and I am a phys ed teacher who it's a bit complicated, but I normally work at the International School of Beijing in Beijing, China. And currently I'm in Canberra, Australia, which is the capital of Australia, uh, because we can't get home because of all this COVID business and there's no planes flying. So we're here and I'm speaking with Joe Bailey. Joe, tell us about you. All right, so I am, I teach, uh, my name is Joe Bailey. I teach at DC Everest Senior High School in Warsaw, Wisconsin. Um, I'm still here. <laughs> um, I'm originally from England and I have also taught overseas as well in Hong Kong. Awesome. You may notice, uh, I don't know about in Joe's house because everyone's probably asleep, but I might have some people coming backwards and forwards in my house grabbing things out of here. So please excuse them when they do. And there may be people waking up at some point here too. So. <laughs> So we're really excited to be part of the conversation for EPEW. Uh, and today, Joe and I would really like to have a conversation together uh, about what's happening with physical education and health as we see schools on summer break. And some people are, of course, are working in summer programs, uh, but we will see all of us at some point start heading back to school um, after summer vacation. Hopefully, uh, as many PE teachers as possible will be going back to work. And one of the conversations that we want to have is around what that might look like. So we're really interested to have the conversation about how do we uh, ensure that educational and purpose for PE and health. And we want to have a, a little dialogue together and ask some questions and share some resources with people and, and engage and see what people think and where they're up to with their thinking and what knowledge they have as we move through these very unusual times. Yeah, absolutely. I think 
it's it's not really the elephant, well, it is the elephant in the room, but you know, I think nearly everybody's in a position where they're they're not still not sure what um, going back to school is going to look like, and they're for most people, um, it appears that there's going to be a few variations in that. There'll be a combination of in-person, online, uh, some possibly smaller group sizes, possibly seeing some students some days a week and some students on other days per week. So um, it is most definitely a challenging thing to get your get heads around. That you know, you're basically are, everyone's lives and teaching lives have been completely upended. And how are we mm. going to best deal with that and do the best we possibly can for our students? Yes, and we're reading more and more that it's likely people will be online either to start with, or you might find that you start in person and then you go online, or you might we might find this be going on all year, is what I'm wondering too, whether we might see things ebb and flow as we see things open and some states. Uh, or countries may do something different from everyone else as they go through, everyone's going to go through different cycles of this. Um, and so we really want to be cognizant that we're not going to see everything suddenly stop and go back to what it was. And we need to be very aware of how we're going to support our students and also how we're going to support our colleagues as we see this happening. So Joe and I would like to frame our conversation today around the so, so what, what next framework. Um, I think we've covered the so here, Joe. We, we're talking about online learning and what that might look like for PE and health as we start the school year. So if we move into the so what, um, you and I have been talking a little bit earlier about sort of the backwards by design conversation. Do you want to start talking a little about that? Yeah, so I think for all of us, you know, one of the best ways planning wise is always to start with the end in mind. So for your students, no matter what grade level um, that they're currently at, what are your end goals, what are your learning outcomes and that you want your students to leave with by the time they are done with um, a class, a semester, the school year, depending on how your 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 year is structured. And use that as a, your main focus. But bearing in mind that there's going to be it is going to be different because if you're using, if you have um, you know your school district guidelines or you have state or national guidelines that you're following um, or outcomes that you're looking at, being really mindful of which ones are going to be most important for your students? I mean, one of the, one of the main things we learned from, you know, the shutdown that we all experienced uh, anywhere between January and you know, sort of March time for most people was that um, you cannot get through the same amount of content that you would do in person. And therefore you're really gonna to have to prioritize what um, outcomes are most important for your students. Um, and you, when we were, Chatting earlier, Mel, you mentioned uh, one very important principle that Unsporticus um, talks yes. about. Mention that. So we want to, one of the main things we talked about was doing no harm. So we want to make sure how we're going to encompass every student that we have as best we can. Um, and we want to try and do no harm. So we want to be thoughtful about how we're creating these experiences for students uh, that's personally relevant for them uh, and the circumstances that they're in. So we want to make sure that the gathering of information that we have and how that's being communicated between our colleagues and our administration and maybe our counselling office, however your school does that, we want to make sure we're starting with armed with the information that we need to be able to make good choices for our students as well. Um, one of the other things that I, I was thinking, Joe, was uh, in order for us to know which um, standards or which parts of the curriculum we're going to need to focus on as phys eders or health teachers uh, is how is this information being shared with parents? So if we're going to see that a lot of our content will need to be less, less is more, how are we, re are we reporting this? Like I think some of the conversations that we need to have in our departments or with our, if we don't, if we're not in a PE department, maybe we're having the same conversations with other specialist teachers at our school is finding out from our administration or from our, I don't know what the, quite what the white word is for you guys in the US, the guidelines for states or regions, is what's happening in terms of assessment and curriculum and reporting. Uh, are we reporting in the same way we always have? We're going full steam ahead. If that's the case, um, you might need to have some conversations with your colleagues or with other schools in your area to discuss what will be important moving forward. For example, uh, our school in um, Beijing, we made the decision in our middle school 
uh, PE department that we really couldn't uh, give a grade to motor competency because we hadn't actually been able to give feedback, meaningful feedback that was relevant to see growth and change and an opportunity for kids to do sport or an activity over and over and over and over again, multiple times for us to give them feedback and to be able to grade them in a way that was fair. So we approached our administration and just said, we really can't do this. It would be unjust. Um, and so that was part of our process in terms of writing units that didn't offer those particular standards, but here's the ones we can hit in a meaningful way and collect enough data and evidence to be able to give a grade that is uh, truly earned by the student. And I think that's, that's, that's such a huge key. You know, anything that we're assessing, we must have had, the students must have had multiple opportunities to practice, to demonstrate, to learn, to grow. Now that's not to mean to say that within what you were doing, they couldn't work on aspects of motor confidence. It was just that you, as, as teaching staff, didn't have the enough evidence in order to take those assessments. So you, may, it, you can still do things towards some of those outcomes, perhaps, but maybe from an assessment standpoint, they're not a you know, summative assessment that you're doing because you cannot gather sufficient evidence of what it is that you're hoping to gather. It'll still be I think, I think part of that as well, Joe, is uh, if you and I are in the same department, you and I need to communicate as frequently as we might have in person. So it could be that you set up a, a PE staff meeting as frequently as you need to, to ensure that those conversations are really being had. Because what we don't want to see, same in person, is I don't want student A who's in my class to get a different grade because they would have been in your class. Yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that that standardisation and those opportunities are being shared, that that data is being collected, that we're still moderating and still discussing it as a team um, it, so that it's relevant. Uh, and that because even though grades will look different and feel different and report cards, and maybe your school won't do those, you know, that's part of the conversation you'll need to be involved in. But if they are going to, Parents are really going to rely on those because they're not going to be looking at other things that they might talk about with their kids. Like there's not going to be a school production or sport or whatever. So parents are going to want to talk about what they receive from the school. So if they're being communicated with grades and comments and feedback, it has to be vigilant across so that if they've got kids in multiple parts of the school, those things are going to make sense, make sense to them as parents too. Yes. And, that, and kind of a side check on that. The opportunity for advocacy there is absolutely huge to really you know bring the parents and part of the conversation as to again what what is the why behind what is is being taught in physical education and what you know what outcomes are you working towards because you know we know perceptions of physical education and health are very different from place to place from person to person based on experience but this is a this is such a great opportunity to bring them into the conversation and mm um make sure they are aware of what's going on and, and show where that that the, the equity and the fairness that is going on from you know, whether it's within a grade level whether it's between grade levels so that there is consistency there but those, those conversations are going to be huge with colleagues in particular one of the conversations we had at the end of our school year was could we do reporting differently does it need to look like it does traditionally in schools and i think that's a conversation for another day but I do believe that we have a great opportunity for students to be involved in their report writing at the moment uh, and parents because normally we would see the students for a lot of time and now we're not and so we're relying on what they're doing as being discussed at home or being practiced by them with maybe siblings or family or other people around them um, and I think there's a really strong opportunity here for them to write some goals to talk about what they tried, what they took risk in, what they took resilience with, how they communicated, what they learned from that experience. I think there's some powerful ways that they could do that. And there's some really clever apps and software out there that help them to make those reflections simply and record that. So that might be something that schools could also discuss how they're involving the choice and voice of our students in that reporting as well. Yeah, I mean, even giving, going almost a step further is you know, again, this is going to depend on grade level and you, you, you need to know your audience, but giving them that, what do you want to be assessed on? So like you said, giving them that choice of, okay, if I wanted to work on a, 
a goal or I wanted to do, try this, what is that going to look like for me? How am I going to do it? So a lot of it will be you know, possibly process oriented, but making sure that they've got that autonomy to choose what they want to do within that. So you might have your overarching parameters that you're looking at, but then giving that freedom for students to choose um, and own it. And I think on the reflection part, I know personally, that is something that I, I sometimes find I run out of time for in face to face, but that's been so valuable from an online perspective to see some of the reflections that the students have had when they've had that time to go, all right, this is what I did. Now I've got the so what, and now I'm moving into the why not, you know, the, the, the now what with my reflection and hopefully being able to take those experiences and then see what I've learned and then move them forward. So that to me has been a huge positive of um, some of the things that we've been, you know, we've had to transition to um, last, last school year. Mm. And I think part of, for me, I've really had to be cognizant of my middle schools with this social emotional focus and lens thinking about the fact that some of them have been really isolated for a long period of time and so they don't want to necessarily record themselves doing activity. Um, I think a lot of teachers are asking for activity logs that, that are visual. I think we need to be really mindful that a lot of kids might feel uneasy about that and uneasy about having um, their flip grid and you might need to think about how you're conversing and communicating with students about their how they feel about being in videos and thinking about how you might use reflection tools um, and really thoughtful questions to engage the kids so that if they haven't done it they won't be able to reflect deeply yes. on how it made them feel or what they got out of it or what they um, differentiated within the, the options that you gave them to make it more meaningful for themselves so I think there's lots of ways we can capture kids um, reflections and better understand what they went through and let them better understand what they went through and how it made them uh, feel awesome, hopefully, about it, or that maybe they didn't like it and why, um, rather than just going in for the activity-based something that we're filming and sharing with the teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So some of the other backwards by designs pieces, I think as a teacher, before you can sit down and work out what unit or units you're going to write with your colleagues, you need to make sure you've got your bases covered from your team, your admin team. Um, and some of the things might be to find out, like some of the questions we're seeing on Facebook and Twitter are all about social distancing and equipment and use of space. So it's really important that those things are addressed by your administration. As Joe mentioned earlier, maybe you've got kids coming in, maybe they're at home, maybe there's a blend of those things. Um, maybe your timetable has changed because they're trying to avoid kids moving in mass numbers through corridors. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've lost your gym. So it's really important that those things are really clearly indicated by admin to you. Um, and if it's not, they get what they get paid for. So you need to ask them. Um, they shouldn't be asking you to come up with a 10 point plan uh, when you're trying to deal with parameters that are unknown. So I think it's really important that you sit down with your team or if you're not part of a team with other people within your region that you know or on Twitter, and just hash out all the questions that you have. Um, some of the questions I came up with when I, with my team were, what are the expectations on me as a teacher communicating with parents? Like, could we do that in the same way so that we know every department is going to communicate bi-weekly with parents and it's going to be email? Um, are we going to use the same online space like a Google Classroom or whatever your school is using so that we're trying to do make sure that the apps or the programs that we're using are accessible for all kids. What questions are we asking? Joe, you were talking about earlier, like what questions are we asking to gather information on our students so that we know what we should be aware of? Like, are they sharing computers? Are they sharing iPads? Um, and and yeah. I know you've got some questions you're going to share in our resources too. Yeah, the Shape, the Shape America recently put out a re-entry toolkit and uh, towards the end of there, there's uh, um, a couple of pages that go, run through questions. I was just mentioning to Mel earlier, you know, I used to always ask the question of my students, you know, do you have Wi-Fi at home? But that's really, that's only a surface level question when you start digging into the number of family members who are using it, the number of devices that are available, the other parameters that they're dealing with at home, then you've, you've got a very, very different picture than just what I used to ask, which was, do you have Wi-Fi or not? Um, mm -hmm. So those parameters have got to be taken into account. I think this one, I know this one thing that we learned um, over the, the last um, semester 
was you know making sure your platforms are keeping it simple for everybody because um you know when you've got people using multiple platforms particularly i think this is more for the younger great levels who needed more parental support you know they were trying to navigate their own jobs as well at home with trying to navigate their students access so making that or having the conversation okay how can we make this as streamlined for um, people at home as possible so they're not having to go to multiple different sites um, make that part of it easier because if again the accessibility if they can't access it then how are we reaching them as learners? Great, I agree. I think also we need to involve uh, counsellors. If you if you're like fortunate enough to have counselling team within your regional school, they should definitely be part of your department conversations about how you're moving forward with social emotional learning and making sure that that's being really integrated heavily, especially at the beginning of the school year. But also making sure that if Joe and I, if I'm teaching one subject and she's teaching another self, another subject to a student, that they're receiving something that's cohesive across their grade experience. They're not receiving the same lesson from every teacher. So we need to be really cognizant of that part, I think, too, how we're helping with that. Um, and that may mean that we need to be really involved uh, in discussing who's communicating what to whom. Yeah. Um, if I'm collecting evidence that this little person hasn't shown up or hasn't done any work in my classes, how do I know that it's not happening across the whole board? Who am I communicating with and who's sharing with me and how are we keeping that confidential but also available so that we're actively knowing who's contacting who? And I know that's a lot of work, especially if you have lots of students. Um, and it might be that you need to set up a system that really works for you and the person you're reporting with so that it's an easier um, go through for you and you're not doing hours and hours of admin behind that. And that might be a conversation you might have with anyone in your school, it's ed tech as well, who's supporting you in ed tech work um, so that you can come up with some kind of spreadsheet or some kind of system where you can easily identify the kids that are more at risk. And then with, with that being said, is thinking about how you can best support them. I mean, the one thing I knew, you know, we had, students who were thrown into, again, very different situations. And we had, you know, some students who were very engaged and some students who we did not hear from. And it was just that constant, listen, you know, not why are you not engaging? It's, are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, what do you need? What, you know, we miss seeing you. What can we do for you? What, tell, you know, tell, tell us how we can help you. So making sure that you are, encouraging and being supportive and just we do not know what's going on for them at home and everything they're struggling with but more than anything they just they need to know at all times that we are there for them and that we care for them and um how can we support them in whatever way possible not a you haven't done this um no i agree there was an amazing article that was put out um uh, much earlier in the year by uh, Michelle Ola, who's an instructional strategist. And one of the things that she, I love that she talks about is feedback. Like normally in PE, we're giving feedback constantly. You're constantly talking to students and you're constantly offering opportunities for them to peer feedback and self-assess. And I think we need to remember that in online work, that can be much more challenging. And so our feedback can be visual, like in a Zoom meeting, like Joe and I are chatting now. You could set up much smaller groups and work together rather than having all 30 of your students in one Zoom call. You could break it up. You could do breakout rooms with kids. Um, you should be doing lots of emojis. You know, you could do canned comments. As long as you're doing a range of things with kids that are giving them constant feedback, as you said earlier, Joe, that's not judgmental, is purely to keep them involved and know that we care about them and that we want them to be active and enjoying um, something about what's happening in their lives. Uh, and not not berating them for not showing up because we're making assumptions that they should be there. You know, these kids have got a lot going on and we need to be much more more thoughtful about about why they might not be involved. And from a you know, from a you know, the big the big picture lifelong physical activity front, you know, we want to support and nurse that as best as we possibly can and hopefully help them use it as a tool, you know, in whatever shape or form is going to work for them in their situation, particularly if they are, you know, at home. Um, so everything that we can do to support that and have them make that connection that, oh, you know what, even just going for a walk 
and getting some fresh air and being outside made a difference to how I felt. It, that's brilliant. That's mm. a um, focus. Oh, that's right. I think things. you can link together that emotional yes. conversation. And Justin O'Connor talks about the, the senses. Like if you can really get students or kids to start recognizing how they, what they're listening to while they're being active, what it tastes like, what it smells like, what it looks like, what it feels like, all of those things are going to build up more and more of that memory bank for them of what it was like to do that thing. And I think it's also important that we acknowledge that there is anxiety for a lot. And I'm one of them for a lot of us before we do activity. And then there's relief after we've done it, when those endorphins kick in and we can really feel good about it. And so everyone will feel differently before, during and after. And I think that's also something we should be, you know, really focused on the, what it's drawing back into our lives and giving us, um, rather than seeing it as an opportunity to just do fitness or, yeah. or just do the thing. I think we need to really connect it and ground it in the, the meaningfulness behind it. And so going to nice. us as individuals, your yeah. youth before, during and after, they vary from day to day. <laughs> you just, you don't. And I think that's important too for kids to recognise that, yeah. you know. It's normal. It will feel different depending on all the different things that are going on. And we, you and I might do the exact same thing and rate it really differently. And yeah. that's a great conversation to have. If we've done, both done the same thing and recorded that information, we can come on to our breakout room and have that chat together and be, huh, really? I didn't like that. I gave it a three and you've given it a nine. Tell me about that. I think that's a great conversation for kids to recognize too. Yeah. So that's a nice segue, Joe, for us. The last part of our conversation then is about um, we've done our so and so what. So what's next? Um, so you were talking earlier about having a goal of the or the values that your department mm -hmm. have agreed on as a group or that we really want to make sure that anything that we're choosing, if we've worked from our backwards by design scaffolding, we've asked our questions. We've solicited some responses and we've had some discussions about what's important. We may have been told by our admin that there's something vastly different to what we had expected and now we, we know what's happening. We can have a look at our curriculum and decide whether there's something in there that we can tweak or tailor or whether we've got to throw that out and start again. And so we now need to have some conversations about what we truly believe in as a department and really focused. I think it all has to come back to that E of PE or, or our health ed. It has to be what is the educational purpose of what we're doing. Um, and I think we've, we're seeing a lot of schools, sadly, that are pushing back on PE teachers. And, and I really feel that's tough. And I, I feel we're going to see more of that. Uh, but in seeing that, I still feel like even if we only see our students for half an hour or two lots of half an hour in a week, there's a lot we can do with that. Yes. And making the most of that, whatever in-person time, we have is going to be critical so what you know if we if we if you do have a blend situation where sometimes you're seeing your students in face and sometimes in the week you're seeing them online how can you maximize the opportunity that you have in person mm -hmm. i know some of the guidelines that i've seen have said you know make in-person learning as active as possible now they're talking about all education not just physical education within that but what can we do to really work on those social interactions um, you know, some of those features of meaningful P that when you take anything away from any learning experience, if it's, if it means something to you and you've, you've had an enjoyable time and you're like, yeah, I can see how this is, this, I can, I can use this for me personally. How are we going to maximize those things and build off what you might've covered in an online portion? And then, you know, you know, online active in person back to online again, how are you going to create this kind of segue between mm. those blocks? to keep um, things going around smoothly. Yes, and, I, and we recognize that that's the hardest part, right? That's what everyone's really so, scrambling with. Like how, and you and I are in the same boat, like how are we going to do this and do it well? Um, and I think there is a lot of trial and error with it, with trying different things. Some of the things that we, that we might see are though, that it could be that you are asking kids to look at different types of activities that maybe you haven't done recently, like your target games. Um, if you, especially if you've got social distancing and you're really being aware of equipment. And it might be that you go through a range of target games and you look at target games, you look at uh, the genre of target games, what do they have in common? And then they have to design their own and build it. And then they, you go out and, and they share and play each other's target games could be part of what you do. 
And then you could be reflecting, you could be taking video of what's happening and then they could make some kind of tutorial for other classes about what the games were that they came up with. So it could be that, yes, maybe we've got our kids for a certain amount of time, but in that time they're trialing different games and talking it out together. Then in their classroom time, they're having a look at, well, what do these have in common? What could we try? And then they could be putting together those tutorials. So I think for me, that's the kind of work that allows kids to learn more deeply about something, but they're still getting that super active work. Mm -hmm. They're still getting to hang out with their peers and be social, which we know is really important in, in this isolating time. But it means they can also create a game that's personally relevant to, to the level of play they'd like to do with the equipment that they have, with the number of people and the space that they happen to be in. So I think that's the sort of thing for me that's super important is how we can really draw on the, on the learning that's powerful about whatever we're doing, but still relevant for where our kids are at and what they have access to. And speaking about like, you know, we, we want to, have, the social interaction is a huge part. We know that for a lot of our students, that's what they've been really missing. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously PE really does lend itself to social interaction, but it needs to be done well, because we know social yeah. interactions can be positive, they can also be negative and, and so on. Um, so you, you might have students working with social distancing in place, but they're still working together. So uh, let's say you and I are on this in, within the same group, we're working, you know, we may have decided, all right, we're going to work towards, we think we've, we've had some experience practicing whatever we're doing, we then set a target for ourselves to work towards and we each individually work towards a target that we've set for ourselves. So yep. you've still got that, you know, personal, um, personal part. So let's say your target is way higher than mine. That's absolutely fine because you set an appropriate target for yourself. I set an appropriate target for yourself. We have that dual target together. Um, so we can still support each other in that way. So there's, I know um, there's many elements of you know, cooperative learning structures that will really support um, social interaction in a positive way. Yep. More than anything, we wanna make sure that, and one of the features of that is that you know, you've got that positive inter interdependence where I'm helping you, you're helping me. Like if you think, you know, when you're planning out your activities, where you can ensure that that happens, you're going to help with positive interactions. Um, so jigsaw is one that's, you know, pretty useful where each person in the group might have a role. So mm -hmm. Mel's in charge of one thing, I'm in charge of another, and two other group members might be in charge of something else. We each fulfill our individual role and then we put them all together to make a kind of a, a, a whole part. Um, the STAD, which I love, which is again, you've made a target, I've made a target, we add them together. That's, that's our overarching goal, but we, you know, it doesn't, you know, we can, we can help balance out. So if I do better than expected and someone else doesn't do quite as well as expected, we can still achieve what we had set out to achieve. So thinking about how you can have that social interaction, positive social interaction and support of each other is going to be huge. I agree. No, I was just thinking through one of the badminton units that I love is basically a whole bunch of individual skilled spaces like I might be practicing my serve, but you're there as my coach. Um, and so you're, you might be filming and giving me feedback, but we're still socially distanced. You're not touching the equipment because I'm the one doing the serving. And then I get to look at the video and we get to talk about it while you then set up to do whatever you're going to do. Um, and it allows us to be at our own level. And as you said earlier, to set really specific goals that are personally relevant for the level that we were happy to, to do or the risk we want to take. But it allows us to have that reflection moment together to really learn from each other what we what we're noticing and seeing and to be able to give i think learn how to give feedback so we can give kids structured like sentence starters or we might give them specific vocabulary or visible thinking routines to help them work through those conversations with each other so that when we do have as you said earlier when we have that time together it's really well structured um, so that we're not just spending that precious time reading through instructions or something that's very yeah because I'm always running, I'm running out of time on a, on a normal day. So now I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's really unreal. <laughs> there is no, you know, every, you know, every minute does count. You want to get the most bang for your buck out of that and not. And then, of course, we're all going to be learning along the way. And that, that's the other thing is to reflect on our own personal, um, yeah, failures is the right word when things don't go right. Because to be honest, we learn more from those things and also let, our students know too 
that, you know what, here's what we were trying to do here and maybe it didn't work. Let's reset, have a chat about that, figure out how to do it better next time. Because I think that's always important to know too, that we, we get things wrong as well. Yes. The other thing that we've been talking about with my department, Joe, is maybe um, we've got a number of us in my P department. Some of us might plan one unit and some of us might plan another and then change out. Oh, nice. So it could be that uh, when the kids are doing online learning or they're having their day at home, we're doing uh, a health-based program. So mm -hmm. it could be nutrition. I, we're going to look at substances and look at um, addictive behaviours. And then it could be when we're at school, we're doing something different. So it, it might be best for your students to do two different things happening, if that works for you. Or it might be best for you to, to be running um, within your unit things that can be done at home or in pairs. So maybe our homework is to make notes on something, practice something. And then when we come together for our breakout room, have that conversation. So we're ready to go. We front loaded ourselves ready for that activity that's going to occur the next day or whatever, however that's possible too other ideas yeah the front note that's that's one again you know looking for advantages and things that have been positive when you're eight when you have been able to record content um and have students go back to it because i don't know about you but you know any, in any face-to-face -face situation mm -hmm. you've got your you know let's say class of 30 students you've got 10 who are listening engage and 10 who maybe were dipping in and out because they saw something here and heard something there and 10 who were off in their own little world at least with the you know, anything that you've created online, they can then go back to it and revisit it if they need to as well. So that's been one nice advantage of, um, and, and going back to that as well, we're talking about access and equity. Um, again, depending on distancing, depending on if we, you are in a situation where students or yourself are wearing a mask when you're trying to teach, how are you going to keep some of the cues that we rely on, you know, facially? Mm -hmm clear you know and this is general population not even taking into a deeper account students who might be deaf and hard of hearing or english language learners that you need you know who are struggling that really rely on some of those facial expressions to um pick up communication how are you going to provide materials where if somebody didn't verbally if this isn't in person um pick up what you're doing that those materials are available for them as well um just another little curveball to throw in there yeah no and it may be that you pre-record your introduction thing and you play it while you're standing there with your mask um yes. so that you can you can be doing something different while that's playing you know you can be addressing someone else who needs your assistance while that is playing in the background so they can see your face yeah um we ended up the final unit that our department so i teach middle school pe grade six seven eight we ended up creating a unit that everyone did. So everyone did the same unit, which actually took a lot of pressure off of us to try not to create three different contents mm -hmm. at the same time. So it might be that uh, with conversation with your admin, that that could be something you could do too, which means for us, it means we could invest more time in the delivery and structure and feedback and communication around that one unit rather than us stressfully trying to create content and and find all the different bits that we needed for three units running at the same time so that might also be a way to have some conversation with your admin as well so joe i'm just thinking we probably need to wrap up here is there anything else we wanted to share with people about ideas uh for e and education or something else that's come to mind from our conversation um, trying to flip back to our notes and see if there's anything else. Um, not that I can think of right now. Yeah, I know as soon as we stop, something will come into my mind. I know, I know. and we'll and we'll be moderating, so I'm sure we could come up with some other stuff yeah. as people are listening. I think the big things for me are you really need to solicit and get as much information as you can from the people that have more decision-making power and to find out what your protocols are going to look like from those that are putting them in place. I think you also need to feel confident that if uh, what's being asked of you is really challenging, that you can ask and ask for help. Uh, Joe and I are both Twitter taggers. We both like to take photos of things that are happening in our classrooms, which are loud and proud. And we uh, both are very comfortable um, 
tagging our administration in those photos so they can see what we're doing and it makes our classrooms more visible. I think people need to feel okay with saying to their administration, look, I used to teach like this, you're now asking me to do it like this and I'm feeling really uneasy about what that's going to look like or here's the questions that I have, we need to have a conversation. I know you're busy, but this is this is impossible for me to do without more, more help. So I think we need to feel really confident that the questions that we're asking, we're getting the answers that we need in, to enable us to be able to create content that is meaningful for all our students. Um, I think we need to work with really clear communication between the different stakeholders at school. So I need information from parents, my counselling uh, colleagues. I need to know if I've got students with special adaptive needs or learning support needs or English language needs, that those people are involved in the conversations. Yeah. We need to carry on as we would have if we were at school in terms of that level of communication and support so we're all on the same page. Um, and then I think we really need to make sure that the things that we're offering our students are educational, PE or health focused and that they really do showcase the values that we have as teachers within the parameters that we have that are being put upon us. Um, and I think if we do that, we can really be of most benefit to our students who are going to need that PE uh, content for them to be active, contributing life members. Yeah, and that's, and that's the, the ultimate, ultimate goal is, you know, we're trying to develop individuals who know how to and want to be active, um, whatever late stage of their life that they are at, and give them the tools to do that. So if we, if we keep that kind of the, that big idea, you know, front and foremost of when we're thinking about planning along with do no harm, then, you know, the, we keep going back to that, I think we'll be moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I hope so. I just want to, I just want people to realize that it's hard. We recognize that it's really yes. difficult. You, we're both in the same boat. We're both having these conversations with people and trying to get information. And we recognize that information changes, you know, what was working last week and what was being said last week will change. And that's really can be very stressful. So I think it's important that our administrators are yes of course what what the medical advice will be and the social distancing and what those cleaning regulations are going to be super important but some of those big questions that we might have about class size or about scheduling or about reporting or about communicating with parents we'd really like to try and encourage our admin not to make too many changes once they've decided on something um, or if they are going to decide something to make sure that there's lots of um, communication from them about that so that we can move forward with our best intention for our students and their parents um, and not be feeling like okay well we were going in this direction and now you've totally changed me over here and I I'm now under a lot of duress about that because I've now got to revamp my whole program um, on a whim so we really want to encourage uh, especially heads of department who might be listening to make sure that they're really making their admin own the decisions that are being made and that we're really going in the direction that's best for our kids. Yeah, and keep going back to ask questions because like I said, with things have been incredibly fluid and changing. Um, I know that I think nearly every school district is trying to get some sort of a concrete plan in place for the start of their school year, even if it is obviously involving, you know, a few different models of instruction. Um, but make sure you're going back and if you have solutions or ideas and you know make sure that you are communicating those because if they're not heard don't assume someone's going to have thought of them don't assume someone's going to have thought of the parameters that you are trying to work under you need to keep yourself part or your department part of that conversation um so that you know you've you you've got the best possible situation for yourself and your students um, that you can yeah absolutely and I think if we, we really want that best education and best PE and health experience we can offer with the current things that are hanging on to us. And, but to be, I know it's different, but we always will have parameters on us. Yeah. Um, they're just different at the moment. Some of them are the same, some of them are very different. And so I just would love people to be coming out, asking lots of questions, trying different 
things. I think uh, there is sometimes time to try something new, like you mentioned, uh, jigsawing, maybe look that up and see what that might look like for your kids. Um, maybe it's time to use different cooperative learning, uh, but just try it out and see what happens. Yeah. Um, because it, it, the more that we can engage our kids in the, the understanding of what they're going to get from this rather than just the doing of it, I think the better it's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And keep, you know, keep, keep it light and fun wherever you can. You know, sometimes, you know, that old phrase, sometimes you've got to fake it till you make it. But if we're coming in with the ad delivery of, all right, let's go. And we're, we're pepped up, even if inside, we're like, oh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Then that's going to really help as well. And I think more than anything, our, our students are going to need that, that joy, that excitement in their life, you know, even, and like I said, you, sometimes you, I think one thing teachers are really good at is acting because sometimes you really do have to act in order to deliver what you're doing and, but create that, that engagement and, you know, show them that you're, you're passionate about them and how much you care. And even though, yeah, you've, you, we're working under some pretty stressful parameters at the moment. Yes, I, I agree. I think the more the smiles and the more fun, the more silly we can, we can make this, the more it'll keep them. Because I think a lot of our kids have already got a lot of not fun stuff at home. Yeah. So the world, in anything that's on social media at the moment, any news is not really lovely. So I think the more we can not shut it all out, but at least give them an opportunity where there's a safe place for them not to have to worry about that for half an hour, I think the better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, definitely. Well, Joe, it's been so lovely chatting with you. I can see you trying not to yawn, and I'm hoping you're <laughs> going to have a nice day there uh, with your cups of tea, and I look forward to chatting with you again. All right, I'm going to stop this recording. Thank you for watching this session from EPEW 2020. We're saving the next few minutes for you to ask those final questions before we log off. If you have any questions afterwards, please reach out to the presenter or send a message to EPEW through our website. Don't forget that we have more amazing sessions going on. Head over to our website, epew-cp.weebly.com, and look for the virtual EPEW 2020 tab. You can also access the presentations on YouTube by typing in the hashtag EPEW2020. We'd like to thank the amazing EPEW committee for all their hard work over this past year. This event would not have been possible without their dedication, commitment, and volunteering their time to providing high quality professional development. Don't forget about our other events like our socials and share times. Links can be found on our website. Remember our motto for EPEW, come to learn, leave as family. Thank you for joining our family today.